Hi guys, my name is Tiffany and welcome back to episode two of season four of Tiny Tips with Tiff where I teach you skills in the NICU. So in this episode, I want to be sharing with you guys just some further basic infant care. But before I do, make sure to check out last week's episode where I discussed with you guys the different levels of NICU, categorizing them from level one all the way to level four and sharing with you guys the differences as well as my own personal experiences on what it was like working in those types of hospitals. But in that video, I mentioned very briefly about extremely low birth weight patients. And for some of you guys that, that don't know, we actually do categorize our patients in based off of their size and gestational age. And we also have basic vital signs that we look for in patients. And so I'm kind of be going over with you just basic newborn information and kind of sharing with you guys some of the terminology that we use in the NICU. Cause already have the copy of the itty bitty guide to NICU. So this guidebook is basically meant to cover over general information about the NICU. So definitely check it out if you are a new grad nurse or wanting to learn more about the NICU. I cover a lot of general information that is very basic, easy to understand in this guidebook. But in this guidebook, I also talk about the size of patients. And it's super important when we're in the NICU because we like to determine our patients based off of their size and their weight. So if you guys have a copy of the Itty Bitty Guide to NICU, I do have a page already on the size of patients. So we're gonna be going over that together. And so basically we love to categorize our patients in the NICU. And so I'm gonna be going over some basic terminology. So we have SGA, AGA, and LGA. So SGA patients are basically patients that are small for gestational age, which is babies less than the 10th percentile. And then we have AGA, which is appropriate gestational age. So anywhere between 10 to 90th percentile. And then we also have LGA. So these are babies large for their gestational age and they are above the 90th percentile. So when you have a patient that comes in and you're doing a report and they tell you that your patient is LGA, then basically their patient is 90% of the size of a typical patient their, their age. Um, their gestational age. And so you're gonna be seeing some really large babies. So you're gonna be seeing 11 pounders, 12 pounders, like really large size babies um, for their gestational age. And then you have the opposite side of the spectrum where you have your SGA patients where they are super small for their age. So we also have moms just really dependent on the birth history. So we have patients that come out LGA because they are gestational diabetic moms. And so the baby has more glucose and insulin in them. And so that ends up being where they come out larger for their gestational age. And then for small gestational age patients, we typically have them just due to lack of amniotic fluid in the uh, placenta. And so it just restricts the growth size. So it really just depends. Also infection can be a problem as well that can cause small for gestational age patients. And then we also, again, categorize our patients into weight categories. So you also have your LBW, VLBW, and ELBW. So we're gonna go through that together. You have your LBW patients, which is your low birth weight patients. And these are patients that weigh less than 2,500 grams. So in the NICU, we measure everything in grams. And so these are your patients that are categorized based off their weight. And so LBW patients are less than 2,500 grams. And then you have your VLBW, which is your very low birth weight patients. And these are patients that weigh less than 1,500 grams. And then lastly, you have your ELBW, which is your extremely low birth weight patients. And so these are your patients that weigh less than 750 grams. So you can see that we love to categorize our patients based off of weight and off of size. And so with the weight, it can be mostly due to just prematurity. And we have babies that are coming in super, born super early, super small. And so we get a lot of ELBWs at my hospital and um, VLBWs. And it's just one of those things where prematurity is the biggest factor on why they are so small, but also it could be due to maternal history as well. So hopefully that makes sense of some of the terminology that we use in the NICU and kind of how we categorize our babies based off of weight and size. And now we're gonna be going over some basic newborn 
vital signs. And also in the itty bitty guide to NICU, I have a page about that as well. So we'll be going over it together. So for temperature, so this is something we teach all our parents too, that it's important to take the temperature of a patient. Usually we do with every assessment. Um, and so for us, we do things in Celsius in the NICU. So 36.5 to 37.5 is the typical range for temperature that we want to see in a patient. So if your patient is of course, too high and too hot, usually what I like to do is check your environment first. It's so important to make sure that the environment is not the factor of the reason why your patient is so hot. So if you have a patient in isolate, make sure to check if the temperature probe is on them, that it's in the appropriate place. And a lot of times we put it in a fatty area, which is under the armpit. And so you wanna make sure that it's in an appropriate place. A lot of times the patient pulls it off or it's like literally sticking onto their bed and it's not even on them directly. And so the bed, will actually regulate the temperature based off of the patient. So if it sees that the probe is not on or it's reading cold, then the bed will heat up like crazy because it thinks that the baby is too cold. And so your baby will be super hot because now the bed has adjusted to the temperature of the patient. Um, when in reality, that is not how the temperature of the patient really was. So really check your environment for sure. This goes for the same when it comes to the um, radiant warmers as well. So the beds that have the overhead heater lamps on them, definitely make sure to check your temperature probes and see that it's appropriate for the patient that is on properly. So really check your environment for sure. Um, but I like to tell parents too, when they're at home, check a temperature at the beginning of the day and also dress your patient accordingly. So a lot of parents love to over wrap and put a lot of clothes on their babies because they assume that babies can't regulate their temperature as well. And sometimes, yeah, that may be the case, but really think about it. Babies are kind of like us. So we should be dressing babies basically how we would dress ourselves. So if I'm wearing, you know, like a loose sweater or something like that, very light clothing for the summer, then I'll do the same for my baby as well. I will not be dressing them in like two or three blankets and covering them with a hat in the middle of summer. And same thing goes for the winter. If you're wearing a thick jacket or a coat, then you wanna do it for the same for your baby as well. And then making sure to dress them accordingly to the temperature. So it's very important to remind your parents to do that when they go home and dressing them accordingly. And if, for example, a patient is too hot, we want to also, again, check the environment. So, so if your baby at home is too hot, then take off a few layers and check the temperature again. And if it's still hot, a lot of times what I tell the parents too is give your baby a bath. A lot of babies in the NICU <laughs> at least get really hot because they're just so sweaty, so hot. And sometimes we have babies that even require a fan because it gets too hot in the room. And so just take a bath for your baby. And a lot of times that helps to cool them down a lot. But if of course that doesn't work and they still have a fever after that, then definitely tell you're the provider um, and then get some fever reducing medications such as Tylenol. So that, is, so that is normal temperature for a baby. And now we're gonna be going over um, other vital signs. So for example, the heart rate. So heart rate is something that can fluctuate based off of the age of your patient. So typically a heart rate that we usually see in the NICU would be 100 to 180. So Babies that are born term or above are usually having a lower resting heart rate. So you'll see babies that have heart rates in like the 80s, 90s, 100, where their heart rate is just generally low. And for us as adults, we actually have a generally lower heart rate as well. And that is completely normal. So don't get too alarmed if you have a fresh term newborn patient that their heart rate is in the 80s or 90s and you're like, oh, this is not the typical range for the baby always make sure to see how old is this patient? Like how much gestational age is this patient? And if they are full term, then that is very normal for that patient. And that's something that we as NICU nurses do not worry about. Um, if you have patients that are usually heart rates in the 160s, 170s, 180s, look at the size of that patient. So you're gonna be seeing those with your lower gestational age babies. So typically babies that are born like super premature, um, you're gonna be seeing that in like your 22, 23, 24, 25, even as high as 27 um, weeks gestational age. And eventually over time, as they get older, their heart rate will slowly lower itself. So that's something you really look out for just depending on the gestational age of your baby. So that is super important um, to really look at when it comes to your baby, really on the gestational age, because that's how we determine whether the heart rate is appropriate or not. Now, if you have a baby that is born um, extremely premature, so you have your ELBWs, VLBWs, and they have their heart rates in like the 190s, 200s, consistently sound asleep in their bed, not moving at all, not crying, and their heart rate is that high, that is something you should be very concerned about. You do not want a heart rate that high um, in a patient that is born that 
early or premature, or even in any of your patients, their heart rate shouldn't be that high. So really look into why they're doing that. So check the patient itself. Are they crying, screaming? If they're sound asleep in there, then question that for sure. And then just look again, environmentally, see if that's affecting them. A lot of times, if your temperature is very high, your heart rate will go really high. So really look into the environment and make sure that your baby is not so hot that it's causing their heart rate to go faster. So definitely look into that for sure. So if you have patients whose heart rates are lower than 80, we consider that bradycardia in the NICU. And if you have patients whose heart rates are 180 or above, we consider that tachycardia in the NICU. And then anything above 220 is actually considered SVT, which is super ventricular tachycardia. I'm not going to go into too much detail about that, but that's basically something that we really monitor carefully. And if that's something that is consistent, that their heart rate is constantly higher in the 200s, sound asleep, they're totally knocked out sleeping, then we will be extremely concerned about and we do a lot of medical treatment for that, including medications that we do. We even ice the patients as well by actually physically putting ice on them to help slow down their heart rate. So yeah, something I'm not going to do too much detail about, but you may see that in the NICUs that you work in. So definitely check your patient's heart rate carefully. And then moving on to your respiratory rate. So normal average respiratory rate is 30 to 60. So it's super important also to recognize that babies actually don't breathe like how us as adults do. So when you watch me breathe, you're gonna see me breathe very rhythmically, even, in, out, in, out. So it's a very even breath. Versus babies, if you watch them carefully, they actually do what's called periodic breathing, where they breathe really, really slow, and then breathe really, really fast, and really slow again. And in their breathing rate is all over the place. So if you've ever looked at a baby on a monitor and watched their respiratory rate for even just like a few seconds, you're gonna see their respiratory rate go from like 20s to 60s to 30s to 40s in a few seconds, just because that is their breathing pattern. It just literally goes all over the place. So parents will freak out when you tell them a normal respiratory rate is 30 to 60 and they're like, oh, but my baby's going 70. Oh, but my baby's going 20. Like, is that normal? It is totally normal for baby's respiratory rates to fluctuate as long as it doesn't stay consistent. So if your patient is above 60 constantly and they're breathing really fast, you're looking at your patient now and they're having increased work of breathing, they're having more retractions where they're pulling in their muscles to breathe, then that is extremely concerning if they are constantly above 60 all the time. But if you're having babies whose respiratory rate is fluctuating, as long as they are able to go back and sustain to a typical respiratory rate, then that's something we don't worry too much about. Cause like we tell the parents and something that it's important to note and recognize in babies is that they just don't breathe rhythmically like we do, where it's even breaths. Theirs is very sporadic. And so we call that periodic breathing where they just breathe all over the place. And then another vital sign that I wanna go over is your oxygen saturation. So oxygen saturation is also dependent on every baby as well. But usually your hospital will give you a range depending on your hospital policy. And if your patient is on oxygen especially, there's usually a range specifically ordered for that patient. So it's very important to look at your hospital policy or in your patient's order to see what the oxygen saturation range is for that patient. But at, for example, at my hospital, usually we want to see anything between 88 to 92 is the average oxygen saturation that we look for on a patient that is on oxygen. So um, for babies too that are not on oxygen, really we typically look for anything above 90. If they start swaying below 90, then we consider that um, desaturations and we would of course go assess our patient. But we have it happen where, of course, even with the respiratory rate too, baby's oxygen saturation fluctuate all the time. And so it's very important to assess your patient. And if your patient is on oxygen, then of course, do what is necessary to help bring their oxygen saturations up. But it's very important to look at your hospital policy regarding each patient's oxygen saturation levels and what is needed for that patient. Because it depends really on the oxygen that you're giving them and the oxygen support that you're giving them that really determine on what the range is. And it's also important regarding the patient's diagnosis. So if your patient is a patient that is a cardiac patient especially, we really look into those patients very carefully when we're giving them oxygen. So I won't go into too much detail, but it's just super important to know that patients that have cardiac conditions actually thrive on lower oxygen saturations. So if I'm telling you my typical oxygen saturation for our babies on oxygen is 88 to 92, usually patients that are cardiac patients actually thrive on lower. So they may thrive on like 75% to 80%. And so there definitely needs to be an order. So always make sure to look in the orders for that patient on 
if your baby is a cardiac patient, what is the oxygen saturation range that they want them to be in? Last thing we're gonna be discussing is blood pressure. A lot of people ask me, what is a normal blood pressure in babies? And I'm gonna be telling you, just like adults or even in pediatrics, blood pressure ranges are all over the place depending on the age of your patient. So it's very hard for me to tell you an exact blood pressure because every baby, depending on how old they are and their gestational age, is going to fluctuate all over. So I will literally be sitting here all day sharing with you guys blood pressures for a baby at 32 weeks versus 33, or there's 34 versus a term patient or a very low um, 22 weeker. So it's going to be very challenging, but I think the rule of thumb that I found super helpful when I was a new grad that my preceptor taught me is that your MAP, so your mean arterial pressure, which is basically the average of your blood pressure, your um, systolic and diastolic blood pressures, is the average of the two. So your mean arterial pressure averages the two together and it gives you this number. And so the number should always be your patient's gestational age or above. So let's say I'm taking a blood pressure on my patient and I get 32, and my patient is a 32 weeker. Then I'm like, great, it is the patient's gestational age. Um, let's say I have, for example, a 40 weeker, so a term patient. As long as my blood pressure mean arterial pressure, so my blood pressure's MAP is 40 or above, then I am very comfortable fine. And also with your patients that are really big kids, so we have patients that are a few months old and you're gonna be getting systolics in like the 90s or 100s and people freak out, they're like, oh, that blood pressure is so big. They are bigger kids. So with bigger kids, you're gonna be seeing larger blood pressures and it's kind of like with adults, it's totally normal. As you get older, your blood pressure will be a little higher. So just remember as the rule of thumb for blood pressures, as long as you're map is equivalent to your patient's gestational age, then that is fine. So the last thing I wanna cover with you guys before I end off this video is making sure to educate your family. So a lot of times we have parents coming in freaking out because they'll look at the monitor and they see it beeping and um, they're just freaking out over it constantly alarming and things like that. And we're kind of like not freaking out too much about it because it's normal for us, but they don't know that. So it's very important for you to go over, especially if it's their first time being in a hospital setting and meeting the baby for the first time, definitely go over the monitor settings. So a lot of times when I go in and introduce myself, I'll go in and tell them about the monitor and kind of share with them the heart rate. This is the heart rate and on our machines, it's yellow in color. So I'll share with them the yellow one um, is the heart rate and then I give them the range of what we're looking for and then the respiratory rate and the oxygen saturation and kind of giving them a range of what I um, typically want to see. Um, and especially when it comes to the respiratory rate, telling them too that baby's respiratory rates will fluctuate. So don't get freaked out if you see your baby going 60 and 70 as long as they go back to um, baseline and they're not always constantly above 60, then I'm not too worried about that. And so parents feel more relief and at ease when they hear that. Um, and it's just super important to kind of share that information because then they're in the rooms most of the time taking care of the patient. And so they'll see the monitor going off and they're gonna freak out if you don't explain to them what these terms, what these numbers mean. And so it's very important for you to go over that information with them. So that way it helps ease a lot of anxiety as well. And it's also important for you to discuss with them that the waveforms of the machine is so important to look at. You always wanna make sure that whenever you're looking at a monitor that your waveforms are even, okay? So if you have a waveform that is literally all over place, look at your patient. A lot of times the leads aren't even on properly, they're barely even sticking on, the patient is moving around, that is not gonna be an accurate reading. So I've had times where I literally go and look at the monitor outside of the room and I see that the heart rate is like 200s and like my oxygen saturation isn't even reading um, or it's reading extremely low, like 20. And I was like, wait, is this real? So I go in the room and I see that the leads aren't even on and the patient is moving around so much that it's not accurate. So then when I put it on properly and I look back at my machine and I can see that the waveforms are picking up and they're showing more even waveforms, that it is more of an accurate reading. So it's very important to look at your environment and observe everything, making sure things are on properly for things to show up well and read properly. So, so hopefully this video is helpful for you guys to understand some basic information regarding the NICU, including some terms that we use to um, kind of categorize our patients based off of weight and size, as well as normal vital signs that we see in the NICU. So I will see you guys in next week's video. Bye.